and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. This week, I'm on podcast home territory. I've come to the 34th floor at Convex to meet Head of Investments, Teresa Patricios, and her lifelong friend, Cam Parker, who works in insurance for Swiss Re, to hear about the epic adventure they're in training for. In June, just a few weeks away now, Teresa and Cam will attempt a massive challenge to row the Pacific Ocean as part of an organized race campaign from Monterey, south of San Francisco, to Hawaii with two intrepid teammates. They hope their journey in their vessel Iron Ore will take around 40 days, with two people alternating the rowing, two hours off, two hours on, 24-7. Their goal to become the first reinsurance team to row an ocean. And they'll be raising money for Mind, which supports people with mental health difficulties, a charity close to their hearts. It's an opportunity of a lifetime for Teresa. Cam has done something similar before, and it's come about thanks to Teresa winning the Convex Dream Pitch, which has turned this Pacific Discovery 2023 ambition into a reality. It's lovely to meet you both. I'm really, really excited to hear what you're up to. Teresa, what's the main motivation for you behind this challenge? Thank you, Helen. As you point out, it's an opportunity of, of a lifetime for me. I think there are three kind of key reasons behind the stream that I have. Uh, the, the first is to be able to stretch myself beyond the day-to-day norms and limits and to discover myself in a more fundamental way. I am a firm believer of the importance of, of knowing thyself. And there's a Greek motto uh, which goes along the lines of Gnothi Safton, which was actually a, a motto of my school I attended throughout my young childhood. And it's been close to my heart ever since. And I believe in experiences which will take me beyond and stretch my boundaries to significant degree, I'll be able to know myself in a more fundamental way. The other is to experience the amazing your nature and being able to be in the middle of the ocean and experience wildlife and you know the sunsets and the sunrises and the stars above in a way that's totally removed from the environment we have in respect to the big city. It's just us and the wild. And that for me is very exciting. I think that'll be very special. I'm sure there'll be images from that particular part of the journey that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Cam, you mad fool. You wrote The Atlantic in 2018. So presumably, you know exactly how tough this is going to be. Of all the things I've done in my life, uh, rowing The Atlantic was beyond one's imagination in complexity and the impact it has on you as an individual. One small secret that the team actually don't know is that Tia almost became a member of the team back in 2018. She went through some drills and uh, we were on Lake Zurich and we almost chose her as a potential backup. And I don't know whether that was the beginning of something bigger, but here we are today. In some ways, Teresa, is it helpful that Cam's done it before Or is there a terrifying aspect to that because he can tell you the realities of what you're going to face? It's a great question. I think it helps a lot that Cameron's done this before. It gives the team and me the comfort of knowing, for instance, the protocol on board and at least his experience when he crossed the Atlantic. However, I think there's also an interesting other side to it in that Of course, Cameron's experience is is a personal experience and I've known Cameron for more than 20 years and he's an adventurer and his risk appetite is a bit off the charts. So I think one has to put that into perspective, but all in all, I think it's a, it's a plus. And we've learned a lot from Cameron over the last one and a half years. I'm sure you'll be really well prepared because of the things that Cameron's experienced on his other row. What drew you to this, Cam? What attracted you to do the Pacific and how different an experience will that be? She says not knowing much about her oceans to the Atlantic. So 2018 was actually plan B. I joined a team of three youngsters and they were 25 years of age. The Pacific is actually plan A. So we've gone back to the dream of making what we wanted to do in the first place happen, which is be the first reinsurance team to row an ocean. If I take a step back and look at what drove me to this point, I think it's the ultimate form of leadership, which you can't really experience in a normal working environment because the boundary between success and failure is just so close. And you really have to prepare yourselves to make sure that the odds are completely on your side. And it takes you to a place that you very rarely get to in a corporate environment. And I wanted to build a team from scratch, a team of non-rowers, 
teach them how to row and then help them become elite athletes <laughs> and then participate in that journey of growth with everybody because we all grow day by day and it's phenomenal to experience and to feel. And it is risky, Cam, isn't it? Not wanting to scare Teresa, but you have to think about the risks when you're in that, what looks like to me a beautiful vessel, but it still looks like it'll be tiny when you're out there in the middle of the sea. What goes through your mind on that front? I think if I had to reflect on the previous row, I remember coming out on deck and there were two rowers, the two young 25 year olds, and I saw the swell. It was absolutely huge. And even though I've spent so much time at sea, it completely floored me. I took a measure of the two youngsters that were on board rowing at the time, and they were chatting like canaries. And I thought, well, it can't be that bad because these two are just chatting about random stuff. So I think what really is important is that the team are going to be there for the team and the team are going to bring each other through the hardest of times. And it's almost impossible to understand how powerful that is, but you can see it. I mean, even just last night, we were training together as a team and that dynamic, the energy and the leverage just takes the team to a different place every time we meet. And I think that's what's going to make the difference. It must be great for you, Teresa, to feel part of that team. Obviously, you're a team, part of a team in your day-to-day -day work, but this is so very different. Do you feel that sense of belonging now with your fellow rowers? Very much so, Helen. We've been very fortunate to have come together more than a year and a half ago. And we've learned, we've spent time together We've grown together and we're dedicating time to, to get to know each other also individually. And I think that our collective strength is very much there and, and evidence in the way we interact. The training and what we've gone through in terms of getting ready for the start line has also been a fundamental way for us to unite and strengthen our bonds. And of course, go through the difficulties around you know, what it takes to get prepared. Of course, nothing will compare to the difficulties out at sea. And we've also very fortunate to have a coach as part of our crew. So we're a team of eight, actually. We have four land crew and one of which is our coach. And she's been phenomenal in helping us work on the communication, help us work on all the niggles that we might be experiencing between us and just get to strengthen our bonds and relationships individually and collectively. And I'm very grateful for that because that's going to be the most important thing when we're out at sea. You know, not how strong we are or how much we can row, but actually how we effective we are as a team and how happy we are as a team when we're out there. And I suppose feeling safe and secure that whatever Mother Nature throws at you, you will work through it and you'll get through that as a team and conquer it. Do you lie awake at night ever, Teresa, and have any fears about the fact that nature's beautiful, but it can also be very powerful, can't it? Are you worried about the swell or the waves or encountering any storms or how you might deal with that kind of thing? That's definitely on my mind. I do try and imagine what a storm would be like. Nature is phenomenal and I have the most utmost respect. I've, I've always been fascinated by nature, in particular the oceans. This, the strength of the oceans is just beyond comprehension. I'd say I'm frightened, maybe not, but curious. I think I certainly will be frightened when there's a storm, but I have faith that as a team we'll know what to do. And worst case scenario, we'll go in and you know, shut the cabins and, and wait for the storm to subside. There's an element of unknown, right? And this is part of the reason why I'm so excited to experience the, this adventure, because the unknown is knowing how actually I will cope and react and even maybe enjoy the wildness of the ocean. Did you experience any storms in the Atlantic? I mean, you talked there about Cam, the massive swell, but did you have any stormy times or were you fairly lucky with a calm crossing? So Helen, in uh, 2018, we actually had quite a calm crossing. And I recall five days where the water was so flat, it was like glass. And you don't even get that on Lake Zurich. That's how calm it was. And when you looked overboard, you could see the Dorado swimming around in their beautiful colors. So the ocean can give you the best it can offer, even better than what you'll see on dry land. But at the same time, it can also give you its worst. And I think one of the principles of the team, which is really important, and that is to be one with the boat. It's very, very easy to fight the ocean and fight the vessel. But the secret is to imagine that the vessel is part of you, an extension of you. And if you allow yourself to be succumbed to the powers, then you stop fighting 
and everything smooths down. So that is actually probably the secret that it's really hard to explain to the team at this point. But the more you are with the boat, the safer you'll be. They sound very wise words. What does it feel like when you're out there and you can see the fish and it's like a mill pond? Do you get a sense of what a tiny little speck we all are in such a big planet? Does it feel emotional? Is it overwhelming when you realise just how tiny and insignificant we all are in this great big earth? That is the question. And honestly, I think when the team experienced this for the first time, they are going to be completely blown away. The first time a pod of whales turned up, I was overboard immediately with my mask and snorkel because I was completely waiting for it. And the rest of the team were saying, is it safe to dive with a whale? How come you did that? But by the end of the row, everybody was in the water with whales. And it's probably the biggest treasure that people don't really get to experience in their lives. And that is if you if you jump overboard, you will realize a universe that you don't ever get to see. The visibility down there must be 60 to 100 meters. You feel like you're in a completely different universe. And surrounded by you, you've got dolphins, you've got whales, um, you've got the Dorado. Um, it is a completely phenomenal place to be and it moves you to the core. And that's below the ocean. I remember we had a lunar eclipse. We were out on deck rowing and it just suddenly went really, really dark. And we thought, what on earth is going on? And we realized there was a full lunar eclipse. So we got everybody out on deck and we just lay on our backs, just looking at the stars. It was an incredible experience. But there's one thing I also want to add, and that is back in South Africa, we used to go out into the Kalahari and do self-drive safaris. You could see the, the galaxy. And that is the memory I have from probably 20 years ago. Nothing comes close to being out there in an ocean where there's no light pollution. And the biggest difference nowadays is, is when I remember in the old days when you used to look back, you used to lie back and, you know, you used to wait for that odd shooting star. And you probably have to wait five minutes before you saw one. The galaxy of today looks completely different because all these satellites are up there and they're all moving around. And the whole thing is it's like a moving beast. And it's so incredibly clear that it'll leave a remarkable mark on you. When you tell those stories, you're almost making me want to come with you. <laughs> I'm still thinking of the two hours rowing, two hours on, two hours sleep. But Teresa, when you hear Cam talk about things like that, I know you've loved the ocean, even though you grew up in Johannesburg, so not by the sea, but you've loved the ocean, you've loved nature and being out in the wild. Does listening to Cam speak like that just make the hairs on the back of your arm go up? Because you are about to see some magnificent sights, I think, aren't you out there and completely be at one with nature? I'm really excited to experience exactly that, Helen. And that's certainly one of the reasons, one of the key reasons why this was on my bucket list to do. Your nature for me and, and the earth and its, its marvels, nature's perfect. The ecosystem, the way everything interacts. We are absolutely one speck in the vastness of the world. And the ocean is obviously even more multidimensional in its, in its depth and breadth. So yes, I can't wait to experience that. This is a physical challenge, it's a mental challenge, but just let's talk physically first. How do you think you'll both cope with the rowing? Because two hours on, two hours off, what have you been doing in training to cope with that? And how do you think you'll get through the physical side of it? We are expecting the journey to take about 40 days, but of course, that's just an estimate. It could be much more, maybe marginally less, but certainly not too much less than that. We are training quite seriously at the moment. Well, I would say very seriously, and we're fortunate to have a coach who gives us a training program every week. And I would say all four of us are very much dedicated to giving our best during those training sessions. Most of the time is on the rowing machine. And when we can, we are out on the water, either on the skiff, so the one-seater rowing boat that Cameron has, or a larger vessel where we can all row together. We've spent a significant portion of time as well on our own boats. It's called Iron Ore. However, in mid-March, it will be shipped to the States. So we'll have to find alternative plans there. To answer your question, though, there's so much you can do around the physical preparation. And I think we're headed in a really good direction. And so I believe we'll be in very good shape by mid-May. And the race starts in mid-June. So we'll peak just before then. However, this not much you can do to cope or be able to cope with the shifts in the sense of having to row two hours on and then only get two hours off, in which most likely about 80 to 90 minutes of that will be sleep. And I think the sleep deprivation, certainly for me, and I presume for the whole team will be very difficult at outset. Certainly will mean physical fatigue, physical pain, and 
at the end of the day, the race becomes about mental resilience and being able to focus and get your mind focused and believe that you can do it. I also believe that once we're through the first seven days of that routine of two hours on, two hours off, will be sort of fundamental position to be able to then cope with that regularity. Cam, how did you cope with sleep deprivation? And we did a podcast with four Royal Marines who crossed the Atlantic. The one thing they didn't expect was blisters and sores and things like that. Have you got top tips you've been able to share with the team on how to cope with all those kinds of things? So I think practically speaking, the best way to manage for those situations is to make sure your body is super clean. So every time you come off shift, you'll actually wipe yourself down, you'll put some baby powder. But that's more on the practical side. And honestly, those type of small things make an enormous difference. But I think the biggest pain on the row comes from the team dynamic. If there's any breakdown in the team, it has an enormous impact on the individuals involved, but also on the other parts of the of the team and i think the the secret is is to find a way to to maintain equilibrium and energy and fun and laughter within the team because if you do that you end up elevating your output and the experience give you a really good example we were on the rowing machine with cello the other day we had to do two hours and our wattage was coming down to about 130 watts and i told cello that i loved him (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and his wattage went up to 160. So the biggest pain actually on the vessel is when people are not talking to each other. If you're in silence, that's actually quite agonizing. So it's that mental aspect where the team really need to become really, really good at. We've got some beautiful footage of you on Lake Zurich doing some rowing. Just talk to me about Lake Zurich and what that's been like, Teresa, in the training. We've been incredibly fortunate to be able to have the boat in Zurich. It arrived in early July and stayed with us until the beginning of of January. And that means we had a number of occasions, many occasions as a team in the boat on the lake, which is amazing. We all live in Zurich. And so logistically, of course, it was very easy to get together. But the experience on the lake was, was very fun. It gave us a chance to bond and enjoy time together, but also embark on the training in a gradual manner, because of course the lake is not the ocean. So it's more forgiving clearly, and it gave us a chance to learn the ropes, or at least the oars in this case, in a gradual manner. However, you'll be surprised because the lake was also quite turbulent in the summer because there's so many speedboats and there's so much traffic on the water. So we had our fair share of waves to have to contend with. Well, it looks a beautiful setting, actually, to do your training. And uh, Cam, you've revealed your vessel this week to the world. I've seen the first pictures of iron ore. Tell me about this beautiful boat that will be part of you when you do the row. So I think apart from the colour scheme, which is spearheaded by my sisters as the design artist, and she's also the professional photographer, so she has a gift with finding that special angle. So the the boat is absolutely beautiful. And I think even more special, I think, are the partners that have decided to support us. And Convex is one of those partners and it's the whole story is is incredible, particularly in the context of the dream pitch where they invest in people and it's about helping make dreams come true. So I think it's going to be special, I think, because we have had the opportunity to share to the world exactly who all our sponsors are and do what we believe is really important, and that is giving back. Teresa, tell me a bit about the dream pitch for those listening who don't know what it is and what it actually involved for you. Absolutely. This initiative for me is an incredible initiative that Convex decided to launch in 2020. And that was the year I participated in the dream pitch. The initiative is effectively anyone in Convex as an employee can pitch their dream. And it entails a short write-up of what this dream is. And then the committee go away and decide on upon a shortlist. And then you ask to present, if you're in the shortlist, what you know, further details about your dream. And so it didn't take me very long to firstly say, I'd love to participate. And secondly, realize what that dream was for me, i.e. rowing across the ocean. And I won in 2020. It was a fantastic feeling, but unreal at the time. However, it also then came with this trepidation of thinking, oh my God, how am I going to get this project off the ground? Because it's one thing crossing the ocean, but the amount of efforts and time and dedication one needs to actually get to the start line is another. And this is where fate has its way of making things happen, where Cameron 
because he knew I won the pitch, came along and fortuitously then at the same time, the Pacific opened up as the maiden voyage for this particular company, which is the race organizer. And Cameron decided, I'm going to do the Pacific. And he knew I won the dream pitch. So he reached out to me. We joined forces and the rest is history. Fantastic. 850 tasks later. <laughs> <laughs> The rest is history. Cam, this is also an opportunity, not just for you both and the rest of the team to grow and develop. It's a chance to give back. And you've decided to raise funds for Mind. How did you choose Mind as your charity? I don't think you can row 12 hours a day for 40 days without being mentally resilient. It really is beyond the imagination. And, you know, 80% of this challenge is actually mental. And if you open up yourself to the unknown, it's incredible what you're able to achieve. So the connection between mental health and what we're doing is just so incredibly strong that we felt it was so obvious to us. I've discovered a lot about myself um, during the 2018 row. This challenge is just so completely off the charts that you don't really know how you're going to turn up as an individual. And I think the, the Atlantic crossing gave me a chance to really learn a lot about myself and a lot about how I am able to stay motivated, motivate those around me, and basically develop and achieve the best that you can for yourself. This is why we felt that if we were to unite this mind and help raise money for mind, we could we could help other people also achieve great things. Cam's right, isn't he, that a vast part of this challenge is a mental challenge. Did you feel strongly too, Teresa, that you wanted to raise funds for a mental health charity like Mind? Absolutely, Helen. Deciding upon a, a charity was the main goals and giving back. It wasn't so easy to select the charity at the end, to be honest, because there was there's also a very strong alignment with marine conservation and looking after the planet and everything to do with you know the future generations and living in a better world. That came close actually as the other charity, but given the links which Cameron alluded to around mental resilience, we felt that the mental health piece was better aligned. At the end of the day, the ability to also shine light on mental health for us is important because we feel it tends to be still something that is regarded as a stigma. And the more we can do to promote and and make this part of our inherent dynamic of how we live our lives, I think the happier the world can be. And of course, there'll be future challenges where you look at a sustainable, something like this convex seascape survey or something like that, because you will be out there in the ocean. Who knows what you'll see? We've talked to Dee Kafari, the round the world sailor, and she talks about the pollution that she sees when she's on her yacht. And then being at places like Point Nemo, where the nearest person to you is in the International Space Station. But if you cut a fish open, it'd be polluted with plastic. So you might not see the fishing nets and bottles and things like that. So I think it's really nice that you've chosen Mind this time. But I have a feeling, seeing the determination in your eyes and the joy at taking on this challenge, that this isn't going to be your last challenge, is it, Teresa? There's going to be another one around the corner. I'm smiling a lot because I think that's right, Helen. Life's short. And one of my other mottos is to grab those opportunities, you know, carpe diem. This experience is an experience of the lifetime. And to be able to experience more of those in one's lifetime would be an even more amazing gift. As you probably know, we did a podcast with the Convex Seascape survey, Professor Callum Roberts, the marine biologist. And it was fascinating hearing him talk about how the ocean can be a carbon sink, if you like, and be really instrumental in helping climate change. And one of the facts that's really stuck with me, Teresa, is that he said the ocean covers two thirds of the earth. But if you take into account the depth, it's 97% of our planet. Are there things you can do for the survey while you're out there in the Pacific? I had the honor of meeting Professor Roberts the other week, and I'm excited to say that we are in the process of finding ways to connect our journey with the Seascape survey. And Callum had an idea around the team being an eye and being able to capture the experiences because we'll be out in the middle of a very unique part of the ocean and send those back to Convex and the wider team such that then we can link the experience to the Seascape survey. So for instance, the array, the type of marine life we might see whilst we are out there and the extent to which we see such animals, 
vessels and other traffic out in the ocean and even exploration or some activities around that. Unfortunately, we can't take the heavy equipment on board to be able to do something more profound for them in the scientific domain. But I think the experiences themselves will be something quite unique. And Hawaii is your destination. That's not too shabby, Cam. (laughs) I love surfing and a little secret that not many people know, and that is my sister, she's commissioned by the Atlantic campaigns, the race organizers, to take photographs of these ocean crossings. And because it's the inaugural event for the Pacific, they've invited her to come and take photographs. So she turned up one day and said, I'm going to Hawaii. So I said, "Uh, that's interesting. (laughs) <laughs> a little bit off your charts. <laughs> so the conclusion clearly was that I was going to Hawaii too, but we were going to row. But honestly, it's a destination I've never been to. And I do have a passion for the sea and the ocean. And I started surfing when I was eight. And it's something that I'd like to go back to where I guess surfing was born. I know that you do have a deep love of the ocean, Cam. And I read a bit about you being 24 metres down off the Jurassic ledges of Portland. And I think your quote was the ocean creatures just come to you. Where has that love of the sea come from? And what was that experience like? Having been in the UK for 13 years, we spent a lot of time free diving off the Jurassic coast. So we coined the description for the canyon that lies below the ocean as the Jurassic Ledges. Now, it's not possible to actually dive there with a scuba tank because the currents are too strong. And if you are free diving and you allow yourself to drop to those depths, the canyon floor lies below you and you get swept over because the currents will take you into the canyon. And in the canyon, there are, there are no currents because the water is flying above you a couple of meters. And fish and the creatures don't like to spend their days in currents because it consumes energy. So everybody goes to the same spot and it's like diving in a fish tank. And because you can't go there as a scuba diver, um, it's one of those very, very rare places in the world where you get to see what the ocean looks like totally off anybody's radar. And I think the link I made to that was when you are in the ocean, halfway across between two continents and you do allow yourself to go into the water, you will discover and see stuff that reminds me a lot of what happens in the Jurassic Ledges. It's something that you never, ever get an opportunity to experience yourself. And it's completely off the charts. Ocean creatures are very curious by nature and they will come and visit you. So in 2018, when you are taking this small vessel across the ocean, you're making noise, you're rowing, fish and the creatures are inquisitive and they will come to you. You do not need to come to them. So Every day, somebody turns up to say hi. And the Dorado, they're always around you because they like objects to protect themselves from bigger fish that want to eat them. The whales turn up, the dolphins turn up, the birds turn up. It's just an invitation, an open invitation, and everybody comes. It sounds magical, despite, Teresa, that you were born in Johannesburg and grew up in what I suppose can be described as a bit of a sprawling metropolis with no open water in sight. You've also had a real draw and a yearning for the sea. Where does that come from? Is that perhaps holidays as a child? What what inspired you on that front? For the majority of my life, certainly growing up, I experienced uh, the concrete jungle of Johannesburg. The yearning for the ocean was always, however, in me already as a young child. I think I must just have the sea salt in my blood. And I remember as a child spending hours in the ocean in Durban on the east coast of South Africa, body surfing and catching waves until my skin was almost a prune. It was just this joy that infused me at the time. Perhaps also my heritage around being Greek has a part to play, although that was in my later years. I try to spend a lot of time in Greece and there's this love of just being at the water and experiencing the joy and the peace that the ocean and the sound of the ocean, in in this instance also the Mediterranean Sea, can offer me. But the experience itself is part of a greater whole where I get a lot of joy and energy from nature. I also love being, for instance, in the mountains when I'm in Switzerland or in the forests. But the water just gives me that extra dimensionality of joy. What do the next few weeks hold for you? You've just unveiled iron ore in its spectacular red wrap. What does the next few weeks look like whilst you get yourself ready? Because as I said in the introduction, June ain't that far away now. So we had an incredible ceremony in a fantastic barn called Tithe Barn in Kent, Farmer John. And that's where the vessel is currently stored and packed. We had to, because the vessel is such a high value item with the most incredibly 
sought after equipment on it. And it's certainly not replaceable in a couple of weeks. It is tightly locked up in a very, very safe place. And it'll stay there until the 12th of March when she will be boxed in a container and start her long journey through the Suez Canal off to California. So that's her journey. Uh, we will be reunited on the 30th of May where the team come together in Monterey Bay. And uh, we have 10 days of pre-race prep before the official start on the 12th. But the team will be spending the next couple of weeks focusing on team bonding. We have special sessions with our coach. And I think just to give an example, we have just recently had psychometric analysis done and we're all sharing that amongst the team. So you can learn a little bit more about what lies beneath Tia, for example, Teresa, for example. So it's going to be a combination of getting the team mentally as strong as possible and well connected and build the trust levels even to new levels and training really hard. Your actual journey in terms of rowing hasn't begun yet, Teresa, but it sounds like you've already been on quite a spectacular journey from the moment you found out you'd won the dream pitch to now. I'm so grateful to Convex for giving me the opportunity for this to unfold. The journey itself has been so multidimensional from the early days of selecting the team. We had a few hiccups along the way and in several sort of shifts we had to make within the team. Expanding the team to our phenomenal land crew who are giving of their time and energy and they clearly won't be on the vessel when we are in Monterey Bay to experiencing each person in their, in their individual form to the training, to understanding so many nuances around the boat. The boat is incredibly technical. We will have power through three sonar panels and two lithium iron batteries. We've got a water maker to transform the salt water into sweet water. We have a sophisticated navigation system and autopilot. And most recently, we've also added a weather gauge because one of our crew, I'm really happy to say, is an experienced sailor and was in the Navy. So he's going to be our navigator and hopefully put us on the right path to do very well during the race. Do you feel, Teresa, personally, that you have changed in some ways, that you're finding more about yourself, even though you've not actually got out there and on the vessel yet? Yes, definitely. I think some of the change is probably more subtle and perhaps I'm still getting to realize that as the change starts to manifest. For me, one of the fundamental ways I've not necessarily changed, but I think I've been able to be more conscious of the power of a team and gratitude as well. It's so much part of that to be grateful for the authentic nature of each team member and the way people are giving the way we're all giving in some shape or form. And I'm a firm believer of energy and that energy attracts energy and positivity attracts positivity. And as Cameron mentioned earlier, we've been so fortunate to have so many incredible sponsors coming to us and support us through our journey. Convex opened the door, but we've also had a number of other key sponsors part of our journey and, and we're giving back and they giving and this, this collective fusion, it's inspirational just makes everything so much more alive and enjoyable what happens is when you go and do something like this it takes the benchmark and it puts it at a whole whole different level so when you come back to the real world you don't sweat the small things anymore and what you find is your courage goes up and it's, it's not just brazen courage it's a different type of courage goes up you become calmer you become much more giving because you're so grateful for what you've gone through and you experience things that are so real that you start to appreciate the things that are really, really small. This will certainly test you to the limits. I think you'll both grow even further as individuals. And I'd like to just wish you the best of luck with your challenge. I'm kind of slightly grateful that you're not looking for a fifth teammate, although there have been moments when you've been describing the adventure that have definitely appealed to my sense of adventure. I am really looking forward to hearing how it goes. Would you come share your adventures on a second podcast? We would absolutely love to. We'd love to come back and do a further podcast and tell you what it was really like. The good news is we have um, the equipment on board that allow us to relay all our digital assets and videos. So we'll be actually uh, in very regular contact with our land crew, which uh, community of supporters will be able to see and follow us very, very closely. Fantastic. I'll be keeping an eye on you safely from the UK. <laughs> you have been listening to Convex Head of Investments, Teresa Patricios and teammate Cam Parker from Swiss Re, who will be attempting to row the Pacific Ocean and tackling everything that throws at them in June. You can follow their progress on on socials at Pacific Discovery 2023 is their 
their Instagram handle and we will catch up with them both in the summer, hopefully victorious from completing the challenge. Just wondering actually whether that means I need to book a ticket to Hawaii to capture them as they arrive on the beach. Hmm, I'll put some thought into that one. Do download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher or wherever you listen to yours. See you next week for more inspiring chat. Thank you.